Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to BCB. Thank you, Angus, to think of me. Actually, you said that I could talk. Could I? Where are you? Ah, I can see you now. OK. Wow. Uh, when Angus uh, asked me to come and uh, have a little chat to you guys, he said, Maestro, what would you like to talk about? Well, I've been in this hospitality now for a <clears throat> few years. So I think experience matters. I think, you know, it doesn't really matter how young you are or how old you are. It's all about to put everything in one little package, right? And talk about what we love and what we share, all right? I think today we, we're going to a very strange way how we can embrace what we love. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you into a little, oh, uh, come here. You have to do it properly. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present you an iconic person, huh? Oh, look at this, huh? Huh? Mike Bell, did you sign it, by the way? Would I hand you a book without? Oh. <laughs> to the maestro, Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. OK. Mamma mia, that's a very bright light. You know, I'm going to be, by the end of the session, I will be brown. You know, I will have a sun tan. I don't need a sun here. OK. Are we all ready, gentlemen? Ladies? Beautiful ladies, by the way. OK. Patrick, there's always someone. OK, but you're supposed to be my personal bodyguard. OK, please, guard the dog. Now, technical issue. Me and technically, what do I do here? How do I go forwards? Or do I need to call my wife? Huh? Thank you. Where do I go? Ah. Right. Left. Just, that's, that's it. Yeah, huh? that's it. Well, Easy. Well, easy, totally. If you know what to do. <laughs> right. There you go. All right. Should we start? Yeah? Peter Dorelli, stop talking. Uh, concentrate. Okay. So where did he start this experience matter? Where did it all begin? Well, we all say we love to live the, the era of the Dolce Vita. I actually lived the era of the Dolce Vita. My career started in 1966. Amazing. I'm still here. Huh? <laughs> 53 years on. That little guy there, can you see it? Or whatever I, this one, that's me at the age of 11. Amazing. It was a summer school holiday and my dad, to, to keep me away from the street, what a better way to find me a little job. And I'm glad he did because that little opportunity, thanks to my dad, it took me to something Unbelievable. It took me to be in front of you to talk about what I love, hospitality, caring. And um, this little person here, it taught me a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, I'm a bit exciting. I was talking to Charlotte before about uh, something that I find uh, very interesting about where we're going from here, from onwards, you know, do, do we, how far can we go? How far can we open this uh, beautiful uh, industry of us? And I think we are reaching really the peak of our industry. I think you guys, you are unbelievable. Were you able to do it uh, in the format of uh, making a drink, in the format to know how to care? It's truly beautiful. And I cannot be more pleased to be part of this industry and see how something that I love for so many years to see blossom. And you are the flowers. You are the future of our industry. And I hope you understand that in this industry, one thing I have learned, it is not about what you do or how you do it. It is how 
you love what you do. And we should not have arrogance in our industry. We should only have a passion, all right? So when did I, st <laughs> when did I know hospitality was the life for me? Well, hospitality chose me. A, because I started at such a young age that summer by summer I was coming back, go back to what I love. You know, serving people, looking after people, people looking after me. And uh, eventually from a bartender, you know, I started in 1966 behind the bar. And by the age of 16, I moved from the bar into the restaurant. And by the age of 21, I was the youngest maitre d' in all the Amalfi Coast. It was uh, uh, an unbelievable experience. Then I met my wife in 1976, many, 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 many years ago, and I'm still together. Unbelievable, huh? Unbelievable, yes. Uh, 43 years on, we're still together. And, uh, and eventually I moved to London in 1980. Um, and my wife found me a little job. I want to go back into the hotel bar. And my wife, she was, she's responsible for many things in my life, my wife. Uh, she puts me down. She knows how to put me down. She said, don't be big-headed, of course. I love that pin, by the way. Is it the right pin or the wrong pin? It's the wrong pin. Afterwards, I'll give you a nice pin. <laughs> and um, she, she found this job in uh, the Duke's Hotel in 1982. And um, I went for an interview. And when I went for the interview, the, the, rest, the, the, the manager, the general manager said, but you don't have experience in the bar. Your CV, it's all about restaurant, because I was a maitre d'. And I said, well, listen, you know, I've been in the bar since the age of 11, from 11 to 16. I love the bar, and I like to return, and I know a lot about, about the bar. You know, please give me a chance. So I was quite persistent. And um, so he said, well, while we are looking for the, uh, the real bartender, we'll give you a chance. You want to do some part-time? I didn't have a job. So I said, OK, I'll do that. So it was the 3rd of December, 1982. I started to work in this little bar called the Duke's Bar, Duke's in Duke's Hotel. And uh, by the 21st of December, 1982, they called me down to the office and they said, Mr. Calabrese, thank you very much for your help, but we have found the bartender that we are looking for. So I said, okay, Christmas at home, a child on his way, mortgage on my head. I said, that's not very good. So I went home and not very pleased, but we need luck in life. So what I, you know, a few days later, they called me back and they asked me if I want the job back. I thought, well, great, thank you. And what happened is that the bartender that they, that they employed, he decided to make, a, it was a very cold winter in 1982, so he decided to make a hot drink for the customer, and he borrowed the flambe uh, from the restaurant, and he flambe the bar and the customer. So, so his career went up to a smoke and my started with a flame. That's how it is. Sometimes we need the luck in life. And I started the Duke's, a small bar. The Duke's Hotel, the Duke's Bar was only six tables at the time. Has any one of you been at the Duke's? What is he famous for? The martini. The martini. Ah, the best martini cocktail in the planet, they say. Right, but you know, what did I do at the Duke's? I started working there, and I was working on commission. And I thought, well, the bar was only making an average between four to 500 pounds a week. And I want to increase the revenue. Remember, guys, you must always think in that you should always look after the house. Look after the house, the house will look after you. Because we should never be bigger than the place. We should be able to create something very unique to allow people to talk about us and about the home that we are working in. And at the Dukes, again, you know, I could only work with, I couldn't work with quantity. So therefore, I started to think about how I can create more money. How do I make more money? So therefore, I thought, well, I can't work with quantity. So therefore, I'm going to go and look and search for quality. 
But have an idea and to bring it to reality is a two different things altogether. So I thought, well, what can I do with this place? Duke's very historical name, London, very historical town. I was facing a painting of Duke of Wellington, which you think about the battle with Waterloo, battle with the Waterloo battle in 1815. I had all this history around me, but one thing I was missing behind the bar, it was a little bit of liquid history. So the more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea. So I did no, did no, no more, tried to convince the management to help me to find a bit of history. I went with the idea of this concept to them, and they said, you out of your mind. You know, where are you going to find this uh, old bottle? How much is it going to cost? Are you able to sell it? So they told me to go away. But I am a very stubborn person. Whatever I believe, I go ahead and try to do it. So I spoke to the owner. The owner loved the idea and gave me the blessing. My very first bottle of cognac that I found was a bottle of a high in 1914. I sold that bottle in a week at that time at 25 pounds a shot. Imagine that little bar from four to 500 pounds per week, I took it up to 10,000 pounds per table, single-handed. Not bad, huh? That's what makes the difference. Remember, it's about create a concept, creating a market reason for people to talk about you. So the bar start to be known as the crazy guy, the Italian crazy guy who sell liquid history. And I start to have a people like Mick Jagger, you know, Ronnie Woods, uh, uh, Bon Jovi, which I didn't even recognize who they were, Santana. They all used to come to taste something that they would never be able to do anywhere else around the world. So that concept worked. It creates a voice for the bar. A, a, an, an unbelievable reason to come back over and over again, and the bar started to go on the map. And then, obviously, I got so crazy that I started really to be focused on the subject. Remember that anything that you sell, you've got a duty. You've got a duty to know about what you're selling. And that's what I did, so much so that I wrote a book about cognac as a liquid history, which is in the British Library as a reference book, which I'm very pleased. And uh, one thing I start to do as well, I start to play with all spirits. And I start 40, 35 years ago, I start to do things that you today like to do. Creating old vintage cocktail with the original bottles of the era. I mean, imagine this one, for example. Doing an old fashioned with a bourbon from 1890 when old fashioned start to come, you know, first was created or talked about. A, an old, the, the, the grand grandfather of, uh, the, of you know, the, the sour, the brandy crust, using a, an 1844 Hein. Um, imagine, that is the time when the crust start to come across, you know. So then another thing I did, what really, pull, really truly put me on the map. I always say the ultimate martini, the customer satisfaction. I always say it took God six days to create the perfect world. Guys, it took me five days to create the perfect martini. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to tell you the story. You know, I had a customer, Stanton Della Plain. Um, I did not know who he was. He was just a customer for me. He started to come in, uh, you know, he started to stay at the hotel, and I knew he was staying at the hotel for a week. And he used to come, first thing in the morning, his breakfast was a whiskey on the rocks. Actually, I still remember famous crowds. And by the middle of the afternoon, he used to come back to the hotel, into the bar, he used to sit down, and he used to say, may I have a very dry, but very, very cold dry martini? Of course, Mr. Delaplane. So what you do, you put ice in the glass, ice in the mixing glass, and I start to stir and stir and stir and stir and make it cold. So I provide him the first drink and he tastes it and he says, yes, it's cold enough, but it's not dry enough. Okay. So he asked me for the second drink. And again, guys, he was again very specific. He said, may I have a very, very dry and very cold? I said, of course, so I made it quite dry. That means not dilution of ice, very quickly, you know, so it was dry. And he said, yes. 
it was dry enough, but it's not cold enough. And this was the first day, and this was the second day, and this was the third day, and I start to have a nightmare. Guys, once again, arrogance it should not stay in our place. Because if I would be an arrogant bartender, I would not be here talking to you guys. Because what a customer wants is what a customer should get. It doesn't matter how he wants it. It does not matter that you know better. You can actually eventually teach him or you can talk about, would you like to try this way? All right? But if somebody wants something, just do it. Do me a favor because this is what we do. This is what it is to know how to please a, an expectation of a consumer. And uh, on the fourth days, and if I would say to the guy, I would say, listen, this is a martini. This is the way I, I do it. Either you like it or you don't. That is the door otherwise. I wouldn't be here. So on the fourth day, I went down to the staff canteen. It was a Friday, and in, in England, in London, you know, it's typical Fridays, fish and chips. And I saw a kitchen port. It was very specific how much malt vinegar wine he wants on his chips. He picked up the chips, he moved it, one dash, and he ate it. I said, that's clever. Now I know how to to control how much uh, vermouth I should put on my martini. But now, how am I going to make it colder? The Dukes at the time, it was a small bar, still very small bar. It had a sink. Under the sink for 12 years, I worked with a, a nice bucket, you know, picnic basket, where I used to put ice, a, a little station for glasses, and then a little domestic fridge, where inside this domestic fridge, I had a little freezer big enough to put one bottle of gin and two glasses. And that's what I did. On the fifth day, when Mr. Delaplane came back, he asked me, may I have a very dry and very cold dry martini? Once again, very specific. This is the way he wanted. OK. So I picked up the, the glass from the freezer. It was very cold. I picked up the bottle from the freezer. Obviously, I put ice in the mixing glass ready for action. But then when I saw that, it was the glass was cold, the bottle was cold, and I went straight into the glass. I, don't ask me why I did that. I just did it, all right? Then I laid the vermouth on top, and then I put a twist of lemon. Remember that the vermouth now plays its part, because by laying the vermouth on top of the, the, fr the frozen gin, had the aroma, had the taste, the fragrance that you want. It did not disappear, but it was dry. So he, he tasted, he didn't say anything, he finished it, he didn't say anything, he asked me for the same again. So because he did not complain, I did it the same way. And uh, he took one sip and he walked away. I said, bloody hell. Every day these guys tell me, yes, it's dry enough, but it's not cold enough, it's cold enough, but it's not dry enough, and now he just walks away. But then a few hours later, he came back down and he introduced himself as he, who he was, Stanton Delaplane, a very famous journalist who used to write for the San Francisco Chronicle, the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times. And there he introduced, he showed me a fax that he sent it to his newspaper, but he said, here I am in London and I taste the best martini cocktail on the planet. And guy, this history was, you know, this, the rest was history. And the martini started to make uh, such a boom that everyone started to come, not only for the drinking history, but also for the martini. And I started to have people like Sean Connery. And so much so, I've, I've been blessed that my martini has a royal crest. I was asked to make the martini for Her Majesty because she is a martini lover. And she didn't have a one, but actually two. So I truly could say that my martini has a royal crest. OK? So it counts, huh? It counts to care. Guys, the only reason I say this story to you is because, please, 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 remember, it doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how well you make your drink. Yes, you can make the best drink in the world, but if you don't care, if you don't give something a little bit extra, you know, go behind the expectation. What the consumer wants, please give it to them. And you never know, maybe next time you're going to be up here and talk about this story, all right? And my reputation began. Ah. 
one, one skill. <laughs> a lot of people of you said, Salvador, you know, what makes you so special? I'm not special. I'm truly not special. What makes me special it is that I love the people that are in front of me. Guys, hospitality means a lot to me. You know, care for the people that I have in front of me. But not just the consumer. It's the, my team. I am the maestro, but I could not be no one unless my team likes to play the same music that I like to play. Remember the words, caring. But caring it is not just about one individual person. It's about everything, about every one of us, right? Know how to read the customer. You know, the soon they sit down, the soon they're coming, how we should interact with them. You know, how we should bring something that they can feel comfortable in our place. No matter who they are, royalty, famous people, president, I serve them all. I am blessing that I serve the most iconic people in the world, the two presidents of the United States, the royalty. At one time, I used to be known as to be the royal bartender. Everyone in the royal family is passing under me, just like what Peter Dorella did, you know, which is nice, but it's to know how to let everyone feel part of one good, happy home. And uh, remember, this is one of the most important things that there is. We should respect everyone, absolutely everyone. Our passion, our love, we should not have what color we, we are, what dress code do we have. The shaker doesn't hear that, does not know that, does do not know who you are, right? We should just love each other. You know, everyone who comes in your home, in your house, it doesn't matter who they are, right? You should care for them. And we should care for, for each other. You know, today in social media, I see just bitter essence. This is absolutely not something that we should have. Because the more mud we throw in our industry, the less respectful we're going to be. We should love what we do. We should love who we are, and we should love the person next to us. And we should not point a finger. I think this is not good for us. We should really, truly embrace. I mean, I haven't been working for 53 years to see who is better than I do. I don't care. My bartenders are better than me. They know how to make a better drink than I do. You know? Again, shaker don't, doesn't see people. Does not know who's shaking it. As long as he shares with love and care. And appreciate and respect everyone. I mean, I mean it. What? <laughs> Sometimes they say, you know, that's a, a question that Angus gave me, uh, asked me. He says, Salvatore, one book you should talk about. What will it be one book that really you will love? And I thought, well, my book. Why my book? It's not to be selfish. I never, to write my book, I had to go through hundreds of books, right? And every book I start to read, it was all about the recipe and never about the creator. That book, the classic cocktail, that sold over one and a half a million copies. That little book, no bad, huh? And still publishing. There is, it's the most sellable cocktail in the world, the cocktail book in the world. And in that book, I started to wrote, to wrote about the creator. It was the first book of its kind that started to talk about who create what and the rest of follow. So, that is really a stamp. And look at that. One thing I do, where did I launch my book? I launched at the Rainbow Room in 1997 with my friend Del De Groff. That was the very first takeover bar in the world. Now you all take over every bar in the world. You know? That was the beginning in 1997. And look what we do. What do we do here, guys? Huh? We smile, we serve and we smile. Today you are very serious. You know, you go behind the bar, you all shake, you all move your body, your back hurts, you know, you're moving more. You all look in that way, you never look this way, you know. Why? I don't understand it, but you always look at the world and never look at the customer, you know. I mean, you know. 
Help me why? I mean, why? You know, I always said that your shake is your musical instrument. So as a musician, what do I do? Do I play this side or do I play in front of you? I play in front of you, right? So a smile, smile a little bit more. You know, the smile brings a lot of things to people. That means it comes, you know, people see, oh, I am in a good place here. There is a soul, there is something that I like. Ah, mamma mia. So what are you going to do from now on? You shake and you smile. Okay. My proudest moment. Well, I must say that I've done a lot of things in my life. I uh, wrote a book, so I immortalized myself with a great book. I make the best martini cocktail in the world, a stamp, royal stamp. I create the theater of a bar, which I love. Uh, and, um, you know, but what was the most proud moment for me was uh, maybe in, 90, in 2004, I had the opportunity to open up my own bar and put my name on the bar, right? And that was one of my proudest moments. I started to think about what can I do with this bar? Remember, guys, when you open your own bar, making sure that you create an ambience for your customer and for your team. So I started to create and design my own bar behind the bar, which I think is important because don't take a job just because you take a job. If somebody comes to you and says, you are the professional, help me. So what you should do, you should design your own bar. We should have a better bar behind the bar. We should have an ambience that we could be happy at work, something that it doesn't break our back. So, you know, chef, usually they insist to create their own kitchen. I think you should insist to create your own bar, especially behind the bar. So what I did, I, you know, not only a dream come true, I created my own design, Calabrese Sink. I say the Calabrese thing because I patterned that thing, and you know, the word's nightmare for, that's how eccentric I am. You know, if I have a problem, I try to resolve it. And the, what is the biggest nightmare for any bartender, you know, in the bar? Fruit fly. Why do we have a fruit fly? Think about it. It is, what do we do? We do one drink, for example, an old-fashioned style mojito. Lime, mint, sugar. Once we finish, where are we going to throw it? We throw it in the sink. Right? Even in a colander. But we're facing always the rubbish. So what I did, I created a sink, which is uh, basically just a normal sink with a hole, you, you know, the water running underneath. There is a, a bucket where it holds the solid ingredient and the water just run. And because of that, I don't have a fruit fly. If any one of you worked to be seen behind my bar, Patrick, how's my bar? Okay. How clean is it? Oh, good. I paid him, by the way. I'll give him a little, you know, give him a little tips to say that. Okay. So, a magical for bartender and consumer. What do I looking for? Another question that Angus said to me, he says, Salvatore, can you talk about uh, bartender? What do I look in bartender? Well, I don't look for anything in bartender. I mean, you know, I employed many people who today are quite famous in their own right. I just, one thing I will ask is, I can teach you how to make a good drink. That is easy done, right? But can I teach you how to be a great host? Do I teach you how to make people feel comfortable? You know, I have an incredible team now at the Donovan Bar. I have a team that they follow me from place to place to place, and I'm blessed. I don't know why they want and they come from more punishment with me. They know how severe I am. Uh, not severe, I would say. This is the wrong thing, you know. Um, how much I care. For me, it's about small details. How much I care to make sure that that person grows. I always say, I don't want you to be who I am. I want you to be who you are. I want you to, I want to embrace you and I want to make you better. Better in many different ways. To be known. To be known not just because you make a good drink, to be known because you know what you are into. You are in the hospitality world. So what I'm looking for in any bartender it is just about people skill. People skill is one of the most important things you could have. People will remember you if you know how to 
take care of you. It'll take care of the person in front of you. People don't remember you as just how good you, you make a drink. Eventually, they'll go back to another place and they'll find a better drink. But if you give them a little bit of soul, a little bit of this, they want to come back and they want to know you. The best thing is when people come to my bar and they know Maurizio, Federico, Cristiana. By the way, Cristiana, stand up, Cristiana. Huh? Cristiana, she's my new star, huh? Vieni qua. Cristiana, she won uh, uh, Amaro Montenegro, UK, so she's going to take care of the world, huh? She's a beautiful girl. Oh, I love you. Thank okay. you. And, um, you know, mixologists, you know, we all talk about mixologists, hospitality. Why do we talk about mixologies? You know, what makes you to be a great bartender? I always say, you know, I started in 1966. I learned how to make my very first Americano at the age of 12. I had the very first slap from my mentor, from Signor Raffaello, because at the age of 12, I was cocky enough to think about that I could do a Negroni. Yes, true. You know, in, 19, in the 60s, it was the true Dolce Vita time. And Signor Raffaello was a bit of a charmer, and I didn't want to disturb him one day because he was talking to a couple of beautiful ladies. And somebody asked me for a Negroni, so I decided not to disturb him. I saw him making a Negroni so many times, I said, how difficult it is. So I went and made a Negroni. So he came over, he saw me making a Negroni, he stopped me before I served, he took me around the back, he tasted it, and he gave me a gentle slap. He said, don't do something that you are not old enough. Respect, be respectful. Guys, you could be the best mixologist in the world. It doesn't give you the right to be the best bartender in the world. Because remember, mixology is only one hand. One hand. Everyone can learn how to make a great drink. Everyone. Right? But to be a great bartender, you need another hand. The art of hospitality. And let's embrace those two hands together. Now you can call yourself a great bartender. And I will applaud you. Okay? I truly will applaud you. Because the bar it is the, uh, the greatest theater in there is. If you are in that theater, then you should act like that. I'm not very good on this. Ah, the fear. Oh, <laughs> please look in the bar. Well, yes, I'm looking for a theater. I always say the bar is one of the greatest theater there is. Why? Because it's a social place. It's a place you will come, you know, that you're all sitting down and you're all looking at me. Huh? And I'm entertaining you. Huh? It took me two hours to put this makeup on for you guys, you know, but it works eventually, sometime, you know. But one thing I will say, what makes a great bar? One word I will use, the soul. And you will say, why the soul? One day, me and Peter Dorelli, my greatest friend, that, that gentleman who's, uh, that we all love, right? We went into a bar. How did we walk into that bar? He stopped. He said, what are you doing? This is Peter Dorelli. He looks, and as he looked, he said one beautiful word, a magical word. He said, there is a soul in this bar. And why? Because there was a bartender behind the bar, right? It was an, it's another place what makes the place. Yes, I make a magical bar. I make a bar that is luxury, only because I work in a luxury place. But remember, I started at the Duke's Bar, where I didn't have nothing. I only had a sink and an ice bucket, nothing else, for picnic basket, for 12 years. It's not the place what makes the place, it's the people inside. It's you guys. And you make that place come alive, people don't see the wall, they see you. And that's what he say, there is a soul in this place. I thought it was magical, right? He described exactly what we're all about. You know, let's not choose the place, let's make the place. Wall, it's not about the wall, it's not about the ambience, it's all about you. Everything is about you, right? A warm welcome, why not? 
a service and care. It's still, you know, we call it hospitality for a reason. That's important. Teamwork. You know, again, I am the maestro, but if Maurizio, Federico, Cristiana, my team doesn't play the music that I like to play with them, because they are important to play that music, I will be no one. It's a name that you all give me as the maestro, maestro because maybe you give it to me for a sense of respect, which is beautiful. Thank, and I please, I'm thank you, you. But one thing we do, and I always insist with my guys, remember, first impression is one of the most important things that there is. No one wants to feel invisible. How many times we walk into a bar, it's a very busy bar, and we're all running around, and you walk in, and what am I going to do from here? My guys know. As soon as somebody walks in, my bartender knows. It is not about, you know, concentrate to know how to make the drink. They make the drink every 20 seconds, they raise their head. They look around, eye contact. And as soon as they see somebody that in need, eye contact, I saw you. Straight away, what a person knows. He said, okay, I know that I've been taken care of that. That's what makes a place. And the last impression, when he leaves, embrace them. He said, I hope you had a good night. So first and last impression, the, the most important thing that people will remember. You have to help me to read this because I'm not, um, uh, I'm dyslexic by right. So I will try to read this. This is the kind of a rules that I give to my guys to make a great team. The bar is a, a living, breathing organism and we are part of his personality. Yes, we are. Yeah? Offer first class service, try not to be robotic. Yes, I don't want the robot. Yes, good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. Good evening. How are you? It's a false uh, sense. It's about embracing, yeah? <clears throat> Your natural charisma should be shined through. Welcome guests with a smile, eye contact. We spoke about that and be positive attitude, ever that positive attitude. Remember the name if they repeat customer. If they come over and over and over to your bar, try not to make it just because they want their gin and tonic. Go on effort to find out what this name is, right? Make guests feel comfortable and ensure they are at ease in their surroundings without being over familiar. Guys, remember? Only because we want to be like this, it doesn't mean that somebody in front of you wants that, yeah? Anticipate your guests' need, even before they know what they want. Read their mood, and in their, if not in their mind. And I will tell you a funny story afterwards. Know when to be personal, but remaining professional at all times. It doesn't matter what environment are you in, right? Uh, luxury or not luxury, remember, the person in front of you does always want the same things that you want. Yeah? Smile and make sure it's always genuine. Try to see the bar through fresh eyes every time you come to work. My guys, when they come to work, always try to make sure that they look every details of the bar. There is something that is not right. See that bar in different eyes every day, only because it's there every day. You know, it doesn't mean that maybe there is something that is different. Uh, drink should always impress people, be consistent, of course, and your knowledge is what you should be never been in question. Now, guys, one thing we do in our bar and always have done, for me, my waitress or my waiters, whoever serves the drink, even if doesn't make the drink, will know everything about that drink. It's about knowledge. Whatever you sell, you should know. In the back and the front. The bartender should have the understanding to pass, to pass that message on. Right? Everyone should know about their drink, what they sell. And never say no. And always be prepared to go the extra mile. That's what I'm all about. And now I'm going to tell you a little funny story. <laughs> what is the best piece of advice that I had? Okay. This is Signor Raffaello. This is, was my very first mentor. I learned a lot from him. Not only he gave me my very first slap behind the bar because I made an incorrect Negroni, which I should have learned, but he was a real pro. In the 40 and the 50, he traveled the world. He knew 
how to be Mr. Hospitality. He knew how to charm the socks off of any female, and definitely I want to be who he was, because I thought he was incredible. But one thing that he told me, I'm going to tell you a little funny story. Please bury this with me. Every day, I used to go to the hotel restaurant at 6 o'clock in the morning and slice bread for over 100 people. Every slice had to be precise, right? There, I started to learn how to be precise, how to be perfect in whatever I did. Then, the second duty was to go down to the hotel bar, this small, tiny, little, charming hotel bar, where Signor Raffaello used to host, switch on the coffee machine, clean the bar, and then, by 7.30, I used to bring the coffee to the chef in the kitchen. And I used to go in the kitchen, and I used to say, Good morning, Chef Afonso. Chef Afonso was sitting at the far end of his kitchen, waiting for his coffee. And every morning, typical chef, very typical chef, never, never smile, you know, you just wait for his coffee. But then one day, as I walk into the kitchen, bring him the, kit, the, the coffee, I say, Good morning, Chef Afonso. And he wasn't sitting at his usual place, but it was actually clean, a very big fish. So when he looked at me, he picked up this fish, and he said, what's so good about it? And he threw the fish at me. Now, the fish was half of the size I was. So what I did, I caught the fish, and I went flat on my back facing this bloody fish. So he came over, picked his fish up, and he walked away. All morning, I started to think about what did I do to the chef, you know, to upset him. So when Signor Raffaello came, he gave me one of the biggest um, advice that I still use today, right? And I told him about the fishy tail. And he said, trying to let me understand as a child, he said, you did not read his mood. Yes, what does he mean? Not everyone wants the sunshine brought to them, right? What we should do, we should try to understand the person who is in front of us before we interact with them. That means, good evening, sir. How are you today? Okay? Before I say, hey, go beside. No. Guys, read that person in front of you. And once you learn how to read that person in front of you, then you know how to make him feel comfortable. And the little by little, you can bring the sunshine to him. All right? So read the people, and that's what I did. And from there on, any type of customer used to come, I used to hold on a bit before I brought the sunshine to them, okay? And from there on, I never had any fish in my face. Huh? Bravo. Grazie. Oh, I better be quick, right? Okay. What is important in design? A great bar. <laughs> Lighting, music, seating arrangement, ambience, glassware, the little detail, bar in front and back. That means the customer has to feel happy, feel in a great place. I mean, look at this bar here. Huh? That's the Donovan bar. This is what I call a perfect home, at least for me. And I hope also for my customer and for my team. But then look behind the bar. Back bar, philosophy, calibration sink, clean. Everything that the bartender will look for. Huh? Amazing. And then, as a, a bar, as a bartender, what are we, you know? Entertaining a chef. I always say, chef is an artist at work, by all means. Whatever he does, he does behind the scene. That means, leave him alone. Let, him, let the plate be his canvas, right? He's an artist at work. But sommelier, what is it? A person that he knows how to combine the creativeness and the work of art of a chef with the winemaker, all right? So he's an incredible, knowledgeable person, all right? But he's not an artist and not creator. Today, you guys are all three in one. Because when I started in this bar, we only had about 20 bottles, 30 bottles behind the bar. Now behind my bar, I got about 600 bottles. And every each bottle, my bartender must know what they are, how they're made, and why. Why makes the difference from gin to gin? So we have a knowledge, 
right? You have much more knowledge than I've had, right? We, you, are, you are an artist at work because today mixology is, uh, my God, is right up there, right up there. You are an incredible artist at work. You are incredible creative people. So you are three in one. And uh, so I'm going to tell you another little story because otherwise Angus is going to tell me off. I'm going to tell you a little story. I've been fortunate enough, I serve everyone that you could imagine in my life. And I met some iconic people like Fidel Castro, Nelson Mandela, Robert De Niro, you name everyone that has come through my home. But this gentleman here, do you know who he is? Stevie Wonder. What does he have that is truly unusual? Doesn't have glasses. And even his manager was confused and surprised when Stevie Wonder took his glasses off because he wanted to give me a magical picture. But I'm telling you the story the night before. He came to my bar and I created a drink called Champagne Wonder. He had a few of them through the night. He was, uh, I, he, not to be rude, but I was happy that he could drink as much as he wanted because I knew he wasn't going to drive. You know, so, you know, so I was saved in one way. So he, he was a quite a big guy, he is a big guy. And um, so he was having a good time. And I had the pianist play, Brian played the piano. And at one time I saw Stevie Wonder start to go like this with his head. And I said, Steve, would you like to play? And he said, yes. Now, guys, imagine how magical it was for the people in my bar to listen to Stevie Wonder play on the piano for over half an hour. It was absolutely a true magic. Something that you can't write, you can't do a script for that. But what was more magical for me, that at the end of the night, when he stood up to leave, I went and said goodnight to him. And he started to applaud. And I said, Steve, what's that for? And my hair is still shivering today, just to tell you the story. And he said, from one artist to another. And that's what we can be. We can be just as a par with the biggest star that there is in the world, only because I gave him what he wanted, hospitality and good time. So it's not just a body drink. It is how much we can care for the person that is in front of us. And you can all call yourself artists if you are able to do that. All right? So... Another question I was asked, you know, how competition is important. Yes, competition are very important. Competition embraces the brotherhood of bartender. Competition are run sometimes with, uh, with great idea and understanding how we can develop ourselves. You know, and brands are real true behind us because brands understand what means to involve you, to make you better of what we do. I mean, you know, I always say that if we have, you know, here we have a, an iconic person, Jacob, the professor, with the Bacardi legacy. I mean, imagine guys, you know, they invest heavily for you. And we should support them with the same enthusiastic that they do for us. Because they give us a, a, a tools a tools to be better what we do. It's not just a competition. It is a how much you can love and how much you could be. I mean, if you win a cocktail competition, it puts you in another stage. They put you in another stage. You know, and we should embrace that. It's not just a competition. It is all the effort that they can put together, they put behind you. The love and the passion that they put behind you. And there is a reason for that, to make us better of what we do. And remember, it's not about winning, it's about participate. It's about embracing what you do, you know, and eventually, you know, competition, you know, I do my own competition, my Istro Challenge. I only did it to, to have a bit of fun, and now I do my, it's my, my fifth year. And uh, I love this because it brings bartender together. It brings love, you know, it brings uh, knowledge. It brings passion. So competition is great, but don't go into competition because you say, I haven't won because, you know, his drink is not better than me. No, it's nothing as such. It's about participate, right? 
<laughs> Who do I know? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Yes, I have to put him in the picture. Why? Guys, you have met Peter Dorelli when I met Peter Dorelli. In 1983, I went and met Peter Dorelli at the, Do at the Dutch, I was saying, yeah, at the American bar. And Peter is not the person that you think he is. He's the most professional bartender in the world. He is the person that he used to, when you used to walk in through the, through the American bar, you knew Peter Dorelli. You knew how professional he was, how he used to host everybody, how he used to make everybody feel special. This is what I am about, you know, in our world. And I love the man because he, although he's pushed me down over the years, my wife always said, you should be a bit taller than what I thought you are. But it's his fault because when we walk, he holds me down. He pushed me down all the time. But Peter Dorelli, thank you very much. That is a true professional person. Guys, he is not what you think. He is the person that I care the most. And he's been my friend for the last 35 years. Okay, that's what we call friendship. Okay. Oh, I must finish. It's good. I'm in time. I'm in time. You see, I rushed it. You all call me the maestro, and I'm very, very pleased that you do that, and I'm humble, and I'm uh, respectful for that. It's a nickname that uh, I really, truly embrace. But I'd just like to say that last year, I was uh, honored uh, to receive a, a Maestro d'Arte Mestiere, an award by, by the Italian government to make me Master d'Art of, of what I do my craft, my passion, my love. And my love, it comes from you guys. You know, I, you might think that I'm arrogant of what I do only because you don't know me. But I am the most humble person you can come across. I am the person that I will never shut door. I will embrace anyone who comes to my home and it doesn't matter who they are. And uh, I will always help that because uh, people like Peter helped me. Because when I went in London, I was lonely. And he made sure that uh, I wasn't lonely any longer. So, and with my team, the same. I embrace who they are and what they are, and I respect that. And today, I could truly say I am a master. I am a true maestro with an imprint. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.